we have a, an exciting discussion today with Steve Anderson. And I can tell you right now, you're going to want to listen. I, every minute I've talked to Steve, I've just, I've walked away with some amazing insight, some amazing nugget, a fascination. Uh, and so this episode is probably going to go a little bit longer uh, than, than normal, because I think it's impossible to condense it down into just a few minutes. But Steve Anderson is an expert in strategic risk and business growth. Okay, I'm sure you've heard that before. Well, he's also the publisher of the Bezos Letters, 14 Principles to Grow Your Business Like Amazon. Well, that became a Wall Street Journal and USA Today international bestseller. It's been translated in a bunch of languages. And uh, Steve's been handpicked by LinkedIn as one of the world's most influential thought leaders. And one of the things that most fascinates me about our discussion that we're about to have is Steve comes from a industry that absolutely abhors risk, but he's going to talk about the importance of risk. So Steve, welcome. Craig, thank you so much for having me. Well, one of the things I want to start with, because I, I just, I have no idea where this is going, but it, it was interesting. You said, um, you know, one of the things I ask a lot, all my guests is tell me something interesting that happened in your life. And all of my guests say, well, my life has been pretty boring. And, and that's interesting because we all believe that about ourselves. And, and Steve, that's what you told me. And then you just kind of casually mentioned, well, I was shot off the end of an aircraft carrier. Like, okay. I don't know that many people that, that have had that happen. I mean, my goodness, I live on the street with a retired Marine Corps pilot. And while he's been on a carrier, he was never shot off the end of one. So what happened? So this was a trip put together, a VIP trip put together by uh, somebody I know in the insurance industry. There were about 15 of us, flew out to San Diego, Naval Air Station, took off on what's called a COD, a two propeller engine, kind of the bus, and flew out to the USS Carl Vinson. Aircraft carrier landed, got captured, um, obviously not a jet. Uh, but spent 24 hours on that ship and watched full flight operations, uh, toured the ship, spent the night, ate in a mess with all the Navy people there. Uh, fascinating trip. And uh, I do have to tell you, when I got off, I was uh, came home. It was a late Friday night. Saturday morning, the first thing I did was turn on Top Gun and crank it up as loud as I could go. <laughs> <laughs> the original, I should say now, the original Top Gun movie. <laughs> so Yeah. Well, I I haven't been on the Carl Vincent, but I've been very close to it. I was I was stationed in Subic Bay in the Philippines when it pulled into dock. And that is a massive, massive ship. Five thousand people on that floating amazing city. Yeah. And so how did this happen? I mean, that's I, I haven't heard of something like this, uh, taking insurance agents on aircraft carriers. What's One of the guys I knew was a, a former uh, uh, helicopter pilot in the Navy, flew off carriers. He was new, you know, it's who you know. So he was able to put a VIP trip together. And they do that a lot, or they did. Uh, this was literally in August of 2001. And, you know, we... 9-11 and it, it just a, a, a few weeks literally later. I don't know if they're still doing those or not, but yeah, timing was great. And uh, it was obviously I'm still talking about it after all that, all this time. So it was uh, a really, really fun trip. And, you know, one of the things, unless you've looked at carrier operations closely, one of the things that you don't realize is you don't have the whole length of the carrier to take off. You don't even have a majority of the length of the carrier. It's that cat looks like it's almost hanging off the bow. Yes, exactly. It is. And uh, one of the things we were able to do is um, uh, there's a place. It, if you remember in the movies, when the, you hear somebody say, call the ball. So that's the pilot coming in. Well, they're standing at the very edge of the ship and we were able to get out there and stand there. Uh, I still remember being told if, if I tell you to jump, you jump 
this way. And um, I mean, literally, however many stories above the ocean, well, there was a net, but if the aircraft is coming in and hits the end of the ship, you don't want to be in that area. So, uh, it, and, and the, the catapult, so we literally went down into the catapult room, like huge pistons when that sh aircraft is coming down, catching that cable and they're going to full afterburner because if they miss the cable, they need enough power to get back off that ship and not go over the edge into the water. So going from zero, you know, at launch, going from zero to flight velocity, and and I'm guessing that's that's in less than a hundred yards. At least that's oh, what. Oh, probably yes, and and literally from zero to 160 miles an hour in probably three to four seconds. What's that feel like? Um, we were in four point harnesses. So, you know, harnesses here. We were told to grab the harness. They cinched us in as tight as they could. And we were told to lean as far forward as we could because we were actually facing the back. It, it, it's, you know, you think about a roller coaster, multiply that by a few times at least. I mean, it's, it's a exhilarating five to 10 seconds. And you're off and flying and going back to shore. Wow. And then and then being captured, you know, coming in and hitting that cable and stopping. You're stopping and you're stopping in feet. Yeah. What's what's that feel like? A similar feeling, although I would say not as jolting as the catapult. Catapult was a, a huge jolt. The, the and I think because the the plane is smaller, not as heavy, propeller driven, not as fast. It wasn't quite as dramatic, but still mm -hmm. it was fun. And to get off the plane and be on the deck and walk across, it was just fascinating. Wow. What, what an amazing experience. Certainly, certainly not something I'd expect from somebody in the insurance industry. <laughs> Isn't that the truth? <laughs> yeah. Well, let's, um, Let's talk a little bit about your your book, uh, the Bezos. Uh, and I know you say Bezos. I, I'm not sure which it is, but Bezos it, letters. It, it, I, he says Bezos. I will tell you because I worked on that a while when I first was writing it. How to actually pronounce his name? Yeah. So what's what what's it? What is this? You know, and and how did you come upon it? You know, what'd you do? So again, insurance related, I was uh, literally working with a group looking at the the um, change, what we call the changing nature of risk. Okay, so insurance industry protects against the worst things that can happen. And as technology and new things come along, we have to adapt as an industry to figure out, okay, what are the risks? How do we protect it? So I was working on helping insurance agents understand new technology coming. And, you know, Uber and Internet of Things, IoT and smart homes and lot, uh, you know, 3D printing. I mean, lots of different technologies coming. How does that affect the insurance industry? And how does an insurance agent help their clients understand the effect? That was the background. I started realizing that technology was going to continue to develop. And so the question I started asking was, is the biggest risk insurance agents face, and I expanded that out into the book, is the biggest risk business face, actually not taking enough risk, meaning adapting to technology, not sitting back and kind of waiting to see what happens. Um, and that's even accelerated more in, in the last five and 10 years, certainly. So in my research, I was looking at companies that were once very successful and are no longer here and ask the question, what happened? And then I was looking at companies that have continued to be successful, and I asked the question, why? Came across Amazon. Kind of, we know the story, successful, started in a garage, et cetera. Started reading Jeff Bezos' letters to shareholders. So public company in 1997. So he started writing a letter to shareholder, very typical for a CEO. What was not typical was the nature or the type of the letters that he wrote, meaning he's a writer and, and kind of, Craig, he's a storyteller. 
Mm -hmm. And so I realized as I started reading the letters, and at one point, I literally took all the published letters, 1997 to 2018, and read them as a narrative, a book, almost 50,000 words. And I realized there were threads going through those letters that he talked about because he talked about what he did to grow Amazon. And I realized there's some really good nuggets in there. And so as I continued to research and think about it and, and the kind of the idea around these growth principles that Amazon used and Bezos used in order to build that company, and I believe can apply to virtually any business. And, and certainly a small business owner is thinking, I'm not Amazon. I don't ever want to be Amazon. No problem. That's fine. But remember, Bezos started literally as a small business in a garage and grew from there. And so are these principles applicable? And I, again, I believe they are. So there are 14 total principles. I grouped them into four, what I call cycles, test, build, accelerate, and scale. Yeah, and I'm sorry, let me jump in real quick because I want to okay. hear this, but you said something, you said something that I don't think, I, I don't want people to miss. And you said Jeff Bezos is a storyteller. Mm -hmm. I thought that might catch you actually, which is part of why I said it. But he is. And you, you know who I think of when, when you said that immediately, there was a quote that po popped in my mind by Steve Jobs that said the most powerful person in the world is the storyteller. Mm -hmm. And I didn't know, I didn't realize that about Jeff Bezos, that he was a storyteller. And I'm sitting there, you know, when you say that, it flashes in my head, Steve Jobs quote, the most powerful person in the world. Well... I don't know if Bezos is the most po powerful person in the world, but he's he's up there. <laughs> yep, I agree. He's he's up there, and and you know, looking at the result of of years of work, obviously, it's hard for us to imagine a life without Amazon. You know, mm -hmm. my wife and I, and just frankly, that there's my wife and I feel a little bit conflicted when we place an order with Amazon because we know that. Um, if we're getting something phenomenally cheap from Amazon, it's because probably because it was made by slave labor in China. And we don't feel good about that. Mm -hmm. But as we try to figure out how to live a life without Amazon, it's really hard to imagine what that world looks like. And that kind of reinforces that whole point of most powerful person in the world is a storyteller. And, and so you saw that you saw Be yep. Bezos telling stories in his yeah, I did. Yeah, I did. And, and and I would say one of the um, key factors, I guess I would call it, with Bezos is he's a writer. So just to, again, a quick story, 2004, Bezos sent an email around to his senior leadership team and banned PowerPoint at Amazon. Yeah. Nobody would be able to do a presentation using a PowerPoint keynote power, whatever, you know, a slide oriented presentation. What he put in his place was a memo, had different names over the years, a working backward document, six page memo. But to pitch an idea at Amazon, you have to write it down. Maximum of six pages starts with what they call a future press release. And what Bezos said is people hide behind PowerPoint bullet points that it, it, it allows uh, lazy thinking. If you have to write out it out, write out FAQs, right? What are the things people are gonna know? You have to think more deeply about what it is that you wanna accomplish. And the second thing is that memo is not sent out before the meeting. It's handed out at the meeting and people literally sit around a table reading it for the first 10, 15, maybe 30 minutes, depending on how, how big the decision is. And then literally they're all on the same page. And here's what Bezos said. He said, executives are busy. They'll say they read it, but they won't. Mm -hmm. So we build time in. So everybody literally is on the same page. Now I will tell you, I used that technique when I started a new company about four years ago, I did a memo. I handed it out to a group of about 15 potential investors. 
let them read it excruciating 20 minutes. How, what are they thinking? You know, did I make my points right? Did I, I mean, excruciating. And then you open it up for discussion. And now the discussion is rich. You're not, you're answering questions. And if you did it well, a lot of their questions are already answered. They have made maybe other ones you hadn't thought of. And then you have a discussion that enriches everything. And then the third point, now, if that project, product, whatever fails, now you have a document to go back to and figure out, okay, what did we not understand that we should have? And how do we correct this in the future? Yeah. Yeah. So powerful. And, you know, one of the other purposes I heard of that process is, you know, this memo, it's a narrative. You're telling a story. Yes. That's my point in, in telling you that. And, and one of the things that happens is when you tell a story that doesn't make sense, people say, wait a minute, that story doesn't make sense. Right. And this is what you were saying. You can sneak it through in bullet points. Yep. Because you kind of gloss over it. Whereas if it's written out, you pretty much can't. Or people recognize that hole or that problem or that disconnect. And, you know, I've I've experienced that. You know, one of the things that we do for people, we help them build, you know, what we call an irresistible first time offer. And in the process, we start with the pains because if you don't start with customer's pains, it's going to fail. But the last step we do before we actually start building the offer is we write a problem statement. Mm -hmm. And it's supposed to be something that you could hear you, you could hear your ideal customer saying. And yep. it's built off of the pains, you know, the top five pains. And and there was one time that we went through the entire process. We read the uh, read the problem statement, and my client looks at me and says, "I can't imagine any one of my customers ever saying that." And on one side, I that made me unhappy because I was like, "Geez, we just wasted, you know, a right. few hours." <laughs> But what I told him was, um, I said, if you don't think your customer is going to say that, we need to start over. And that's, I believe that's what Bezos was doing. Bezos, I'm sorry, I'm going to correct that's okay. Um, I believe that's what you were saying Bezos was doing, was it would pull out things, you know, back to what you were saying. You could sneak things through in bullet point that when you put them in narrative format, people listen to it and like, no, sorry, that's not a believable story. Yeah. Are there holes in it? Or what about this? Or, I mean, it just, it, um, it makes the whole process. Actually, it's the idea of slowing down to speed up because yeah. it's, it's a slower process, but you don't get months down the, the, the track of creating something new and all of a sudden realize, oh, we didn't think about this. You do all that in the beginning. So you save time at the, uh, as you're building. Yeah. Well, in the case of my client, if we had just plowed forward saying, no, no, we're going to make this work. We would have wasted months mm -hmm. as it was. We had just wasted a few hours. And I would say it wasn't even a waste. We'd, yeah. we'd spend a few hours kind of in the Thomas Edison uh, quote, you know, we, we spent three hours learning what the ideal customer wouldn't say. So right. we could go work on what they would say. What they would say. Yeah, exactly. Thank you for sharing that about him being a, a storyteller. I just, I never knew, but it makes so much sense once you lay that out. Well, and and, uh, and I don't know, Craig, you, you may have read shareholder letters. Typically they're boring. You know, they're touting the company and Bezos did that, no question. But it's the, it's the weaving of the stories and the, here's what we did. And, you know, he talks about decision-making and he talks about um, all kinds of different things of not just here's what we did, but this is how we did it and why we do it this way. That's, again, it was, a, you know, and, and I don't know that I've used that word before, but it really was the storytelling that caught my attention. When I said there were threads through the letters, I mean, that's like a, a story. There are threads through a story. You know, there's the hero and the victim and the, you know, all of the different parts of storytelling. Yeah. 
So I cut you off a few minutes ago. You were about to talk about the 14 principles. And I didn't want to miss that because that's really important. But I also wanted to make sure we didn't miss this storytelling aspect yeah. and the power of that. It If people will embrace storytelling, and I've, I've got a friend named Matt Zahn that runs a podcast called Stories with Traction. Um, if people will embrace the power of the story, it will change not only your life, but it will it will change your life because of the way you change the lives of others. Yeah, totally. I agree. So let's I talk about, I, I think what I was saying is, you know, 14 principles a lot. So I, we, I broke them up into four cycles, what I call it. test, build, accelerate, and scale. And I believe businesses are always going through those cycles. It could be a department doing part of it, the business as a whole, small business, larger businesses, et cetera. And, and to, to put some context around the, the principles. Um, so I, I, I will give you one. I think it's my favorite. Uh, the, in the test cycle, the first principle is called encourage successful failure. Now, typically you don't hear those two words together, a successful and a failure. But the idea is kind of back to my six page memo, if something doesn't work and you see Amazon all the time closing things down, trying new things, that's part of that process. And they encourage employees to experiment. And if you're going to experiment, you're going to fail. And if you're going to experiment and you're not going to fail, it's not an experiment, right? I mean, again, back to your Thomas Edison, I mean, multiple examples of, of that, that, that ultimate success often comes out of failures when you're looking for something else. And the, and the question is, as a business owner, are you building a culture that supports that? Meaning, I don't believe employees are actually afraid of failure, but I do believe they're afraid of the consequences of failure. Meaning, my career's damaged, my, you know, I don't get a promotion because of this. Now, I absolutely have to say, this is not stupid risk, right? So that's that idea of risk taking. It's not just, let's see what happens. It's very intentional. It's very focused. It's let's mitigate the risk as early as possible. Let's understand where the problems are going to be so we can solve them either with internal resources or now we know who we need to hire and what expertise we need to hire to make this project go forward. Yeah, I think there's an important question that comes in there. And I think it's something every business owner faces is how what's the difference between stupid risk and, 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 and bad risk? And, and a lot of things look stupid until they succeed. Mm -hmm. And so I, I don't know. I don't feel like I personally have the compass to know what's a stupid risk versus what's a bad risk, but I still need a criteria for determining the risk I can accept versus the risk I cannot. How would you answer that? So I think a couple of things. One is, uh, you know, obviously now Amazon has the resources to take big risks because they can pay for them. Early on, they didn't. And it, again, building this culture of invention not just innovation. And so a phrase he uses a lot in his letters is we invent on behalf of the customer. So go back to your example, my customer wouldn't say this. Well, at Amazon, they want to know their customers so deeply, so intimately that they can invent on their behalf. They can understand. And that takes a lot of effort and a lot of work. Uh, and it's not just sitting in an office. It's actually going out and seeing people and seeing what they do. Um, a, 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 an example comes to mind is the Kindle, the e-reader. Mm -hmm. Now, there were e-readers out before Kindle came along. But the, the goal of the Kindle was any book in the world. Let me rephrase this. You can read any book in the world in 60 seconds or less. Hmm. What was the change? A Kindle doesn't have to be plugged into a computer to download a book. Yeah. Huge, again, think about at the time, huge technological problem. And 
you can start a book on one device and continue reading it on another, meaning you could start it on a Kindle. I do it all the time. You probably do too. Start it on a Kindle, go to your phone, go to another device, pick up exactly where you left off. Yeah. Huge technological problem. They have to be able to understand the state of those devices over maybe days or months and be able to know which is, has the most current. Again, huge technology problem. They solved it. And the Kindle now is the primary e-reader for those that like that format. Yeah. And that's, I, it, I rarely get a, uh, a book in print. My preferred platform is Kindle. Um, I published a couple of books and I discovered that I'm, there's more people that still like paper than, than me, yes. but, but an example of a, something they, a place where they experimented, it made perfect sense, but it clearly failed. And I don't even remember the, the name of the product, but they were installing little buttons in your house uh -huh. You know, so if, uh, in your laundry room, you would have a button for laundry detergent. Yes. And if you were running out of laundry detergent, you hit the button instead of having to remember to go back to the computer and order some. I would have thought that would have been a massive success. Obviously, it failed. Yep. Well, and and again, let's do, you know how they define failure. It, it didn't generate enough revenue to justify the expense, a and. Absolutely. Now, the question is, what did they learn from that that they applied to something else? So let me give you another quick example. Amazon in um, 2014 released a phone called the Fire Phone, an Amazon phone. Now, it was Jeff Bezos' pet project. He thought having a phone where you could more easily shop on Amazon is a great idea. Of course he would, but nobody else did. It was a dismal failure. At one point, they sold it for 99 cents and they couldn't give it away. Wow. That year, 2014, they wrote off $178 million in inventory and um, development costs. Gone. It's failure. Potent success. They learned a lot about voice and how to process voice. They had to because it's a phone. Four months after the release of the Fire Phone, Bezos got his first demonstration for a um, Brindle's uh, can-ish device that you could talk to and it would answer you. We now know as the Echo and Alexa as the software that runs it. All that voice technology that they learned they put into the Echo devices, that now has become obviously pretty successful. What's interesting though, is not as successful as Amazon thought. Now they're rethinking what the Echo is because they thought the Echo people would just like the button. People would just order this, order that. That's where they would make their revenue. But the, the Echo uh, Alexa department has lost billions of dollars over the last number of years because it didn't do what it thought. So they're continuing to rework what that might look like. But those are ubiquitous now in many, many homes. We have, I don't know, I don't know how many we have actually, multiple yeah. devices. And you, you know what I think is really important to, uh, to highlight here? I had completely forgotten about the Fire Phone. Most people and have. <laughs> Easily, easily forgotten. Yes. Um, and, you know, until you started talking, I hadn't thought about those little buttons. I don't even remember the name of the product. A, a, a dots, maybe. I don't, I don't either. I'd have to look that up. But I think the important lesson there is people don't remember the failures. You know, as, as business owners, I think it's easy for us to get too wound up about failures and, and see it as, you know, some, um, bad mark on on us right. as a leader. brand damage or you know, any of those things yep but the fact is that amazon wins more times than it loses and people see amazon as a winner yes yeah yes
Very much so. I mean, again, you can point to Prime. Crazy idea. Free shipping, two days or less. And especially at the time it launched. I mean, the CFO, I mean, the whole senior leadership team said, we can't do that. We're going to lose massive amounts of money. Amazon Web Services, AWS, another big bet, right? Help solve an internal problem. And they realized, hey, other customers might want this same capability. Amazon Marketplace, opening up Amazon sales pages to third-party sellers. But again, here's what Bezos said. If a third-party seller has a product that we're, we don't have, that's better for the customer. If a third-party seller has a price lower than what we can offer, that's better for the customer. And if it's better for the customer, it'll eventually be better for Amazon. And now over 60% of the sales on Amazon go through third-party sellers. So even kind of your comment earlier on, either about you know small businesses, but Amazon has created millions of small businesses because they have opened up their platform. Now they charge for it. So that's another revenue source for Amazon, but it gives small business owners the ability not to have to build out e-commerce sites, not have to build out logistics, not to have all that advertising stuff. They can piggyback on what Amazon has done. And Amazon takes a piece of that. Yeah. One of the latest things I've seen Amazon do, obviously they've spent you know, the last five or 10 years building their own distribution network. Mm -hmm. And no longer is the UPS truck dropping off your Amazon delivery. It's an Amazon truck. Yep. And now Amazon's getting into the shipping business. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. They it, And again, it's very similar to Amazon Web Services, AWS. So computing, renting computing power, basically. Now you can rent logistics. And again, massive investments of that logistics network now they're able, and, and that's another principle, which is long-term thinking. Yeah. So Bezos is very much a long-term thinker. He thinks multi-years ahead. Investment now will pay off later. And logistics as a service is definitely something they're building. And, you know, the thing that just really marvels... Uh, shocks my mind a little bit as, as we're talking and I'm listening to you talk about this culture of risk and all that you do. And I'm like, this is a guy from the insurance industry. I mean, I honestly, I mean, I've never heard, I've never heard somebody from insurance talk so much, you know, so positively about creating a culture of risk. Um, and, and, I'm curious, what what made you think that way? What kind of set you apart? Because I, I think that's part of the genius of, of your success is you've been able to bring together two different types of thought in one industry that normally don't coexist. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> there may be a couple things. One is... Um, I have a unique background with the insurance aspect and, you know, I could get really geeky insurance too, but I also have the technology and, and I think both inform each other and the insurance in, in any industry, I don't care who it is, is not going to slow down technology advancement. So now we're talking a lot about generative AI and what's going to happen and all those kinds of things. It's going to develop. It's going to be part of what we do. The question is, how are you going to address it as a business owner? And I'm spending a lot of time right now in that arena. Again, what's the risk? Is the risk? Absolutely. You can't walk out your door in the morning and not face risk. Get in your car, fly in air. I mean, whatever it is, it's how you understand it and how you mitigate it meaning how do you reduce the risk as a business owner? And again, insurance is, is one of the ways that we do that. We have an insurance policy where we transfer the risk to an insurance company. We have safety programs, so we try and mitigate the risk, all those kinds of things. But bringing that into the technology development and technology world, I think is, um, I, it is unique in terms of how I think.
And it's been kind of fun shaking up the industry a little bit and getting others to think about risk in a different way. Yeah. Well, let's talk a little bit about AI. I mean, you brought that up and <clears throat> AI, you know, I, uh, I was talking to somebody who went to a conference recently and he said 80% of it was AI. And, you know, obviously a massive innovation, massive innovation that will forever <clears throat> change our lives. And there's a part of me that always, yeah, I'm, I'm waiting for somebody to come out with the AI brewed coffee just so that they could get. <laughs> no question. <laughs> yeah. It's like, we're going to do everything AI. Your, your coffee's brewed by an AI. Right. And and so there's there's going to be some, um, you know, some overshoot there and there's going to be some undershoot. And w what's your take on this and how, how should people approach AI? So AI, I mean, a, a couple of things I will say. One is, you know, what we experienced last year with OpenAI releasing ChatGPT. That's kind of what sparked a lot of stuff. It's a 65 year old technology development cycle. Literally the first use of the term artificial intelligence was in 1955. And it's been slowly developing and that's a very typical technology development cycle. It's deceptive, meaning you don't think about it or it's stupid, but you know, I've been using versions of, of what we now call AI, machine learning, pattern matching, since the early days of speech recognition, mm -hmm. using a microphone and trying to, to talk and type, right? Now that's easy and really pretty good. Um, but we, but last November, a um, little over a year ago, hype cycle went really high, typical for something new. I mean, Uber, Airbnb, right? All those crowd sharing type platforms had a similar and then kind of go down when expectations don't meet uh, hype and then start building back up into real use cases or real examples of how it can be used to improve. Okay, so that's background. It's been around a long time. It's not new. I think from my perspective, um, I'm not afraid of it. I actually don't believe that silicon can become biologic. We don't even understand now how the human brain works. Thinking that a computer can be programmed for what we don't understand, I don't believe is correct. Um, so that piece of it, you know, will there be bad uses? Of course, there always are. There are bad actors out there. And we'll figure out, you know, how we manage that. Um, I, I don't believe... Here's, I, I don't believe employees will be replaced by AI. I, be, I believe employees will be replaced by other people who are using AI to do work. So I believe it's employee augmentation, not employee replacement. And, and, I, and I sort of like the phrase automated intelligence, not artificial, because it really is a program. Yeah. So those are... A few random thoughts. Well, one of the things that I'm seeing, and there's, um, so in the marketing world, you know, especially in content marketing, you know, there's a lot of people rejoicing. They're saying, I'm never going to have to write another blog again in my life. I'm going to have AI spin up, you know, a hundred blog articles for me next week. We'll put them out there and, and get them, you know, they'll get ranked and they'll drive traffic. Right. I think the important thing to remember is, your competitor is thinking the exact same thing. So if you're doing that, that just means you're now at the new noise floor level. Right. The noise right, floor right. just moved. And if you want to poke out of the noise, it's not going to be by doing exactly what everybody else is doing. Agreed. And, and I think it's a tool, the human aspect of it. I mean, if you're not editing everything that goes, that you see come out of it, you're a toast. I mean, I, I just, it's becoming easier and easier to tell people who are doing that. And then you talk about losing brand value, losing trust, losing, I mean, those are bigger issues than cranking out content. And it, it, it's a, I mean, I believe it solves the blank page problem. Meaning here's, here's what I want to write about. Where do I start? 
Yeah. Pretty good at that. But it's where do I start, not where do I finish? And and I use it if I'm trying to work on like a headline or <clears throat> something, I'll ask it, hey, give me 10 headlines that say this. Yeah. And it helps me, it helps me get some direction. It helps stimulate yep. the creative process. Exactly. But but I published two books last year and I look at both of those books. One's a business book, one's a personal book. I don't believe AI could have written either of those books. Mm -mm. And I would spend more time writing the prompts right. to generate. <laughs> and trying to get something out of it. Yes, agreed. Yeah. Yeah. So, so it's a tool. It's here. We'll learn how to use it. We are learning how to use it. And um, it, it will change things. There's no question about that. But, you know, frankly, um, I, the example I've been using is, if you remember, Greg, when the spreadsheet came out, that put like 400,000 bookkeepers out of business. Yeah. Right? We didn't need the bookkeepers anymore because we could have a spreadsheet, plug in numbers, and it would automatically recalculate everything. But what it did do was change the industry into an advice industry, not a numbers industry. So that I think definitely we will see is how some of those mundane rote tasks can be done, probably should be done, which allows employees to focus on what they do best, whatever that is in their particular industry. Yeah. Well, I'll give a very practical example to what we're doing right now. I'm working on, I'm trying to create an automation so that when, when I complete a podcast episode, I can feed the transcript into AI and ask it to give me three show summaries. Yes, absolutely. And and that gives me my starting point where I can break it down. It makes my time more efficient, but it doesn't eliminate the human element. The human Correct. element is essential. Correct. So, yep. yep. And I think those are, are, again, I think those are good examples. It gives you a starting point. You go in and put your voice on it and all those kinds of things. But um, those are just, I, I think those kinds of examples are being multiplied out as people are coming off the hype cycle and starting to look at it as a tool and how can we use it and where should we use it? Yeah. Well, Steve, we've run into a problem I knew we would run into. <laughs> we've barely touched your book. I mean, we've covered one aspect of your book. We haven't even talked about your your other company, Catalyst. And, and I know we could talk for another two or three hours. This has been fascinating. Um, so I guess where we are right now, tell us a little bit about your company, Catalyst. And I, I apologize for not getting into more details on your book because, frankly, what you just covered, I think, was so valuable. If people just take that and focus on that, I think they need to buy your book and then take the next principle and start working on that. Yeah. Yeah. But tell me a little bit about Catalyst. What What is so Catalyst? Catalyst, um, and again, it's, you know, picking a company name is interesting, but Catalyst for change, IT at the end for technology. So Catalyst. And basically it's it's a company I started and founded with seven other state insurance agent associations. They invested in the company to help solve a problem for their members, which was having trusted technology advice and resources and information. And so we now work with 23 different state associations for on behalf of their members. And we provide advice on the technology that they should be using, how to select the right platform for their needs. And it covers, actually, we have about 25 different categories of technology. So social, website, database systems, you know, all kinds of different areas. And we gather information about the vendors that are out there and write reviews about their product, all to service agents and help them manage uh, their technology to maximize it and to help them with efficiency and profitability. That sounds awesome. I, I think, you know, anybody in the insurance industry that's listening, you need a person like Steve in your life. Yeah. You know, and, and I think that's, and Steve, that's what we were talking about. You bring together two types of thought 
that you know fr from different sides the you know the, let's take risk and let's avoid risk and you bring those two thoughts together and and i think that's one of the keys to your success and, and so i do hope people reach out to you i hope people get your book uh, obviously a lot of wisdom there i'm sorry we didn't have time to cover more details of it well me too but uh i, I understand there's again lots of principles, lots of information. Uh, took a couple years to write it. And so, um, but I'm glad we were able to go over what we did. Well, thanks for coming on Leaders and Legacies. Craig, I appreciate it. Thanks for having me.